You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. We're glad you're watching today. We have three gospel preachers who have been doing a fantastic job all this month in answering your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm Bobby Liddell. I'm Administrative Dean of the Memphis School of Preaching. I also work with the church in Munford, Tennessee. My name is Tom Waycaster, and I work with the Memphis School of Preaching in the role of Dean of Admissions and serve as an instructor. Hello, my name is Robert Sharnock. I serve as a preacher with the Munford Church of Christ in Munford, Tennessee. I'm glad to be here. We've got some great questions today. Let's get right to them. Our first one to Brother Waycaster. What is the doctrine of, quote, apparent age, unquote? Brother Waycaster. For the last century, there has been a battle waged in what we sometimes call the Western world, and certainly it's taking place on the soil of America as well, between the theory of creation and the biblical account of God's creation in Genesis chapter 1. Those who disbelieve in God or in the Bible hold to the theory of evolution, and the, those who believe in the Bible, and particularly the 24-hour uh, limitation placed upon the creation, those two oppose one another. So when we ask the question about the apparent age, let's take an atheist who makes the argument in trying to defend evolution. He looks at a tree and he sees the rings in that tree and he calculates by modern procedures that that tree is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand years old. Or he'll look at rocks and he'll estimate the age of that rock by natural processes that exist today. But to those who hold to the 24-hour creation, of which I'm one of those, uh, you obviously have a shorter, much shorter period of time between the creation and the day and age in which we live, approximately somewhere around 6,000 years. So let me present a question to you as we deal with this apparent age question. If I were on the scene when God created Adam and Eve on that uh, day of creation, and I were to look at Adam and Eve, how old would they appear to me? Well, they would look like adults, would they not? Because God made the world fully functional. So although Adam and Eve were perhaps only one day old, they may appear to be in their 30s or their 40s. So as we struggle with the two different theories or two different accounts that are presented, you have to keep in mind that just looking at something and the way it appears is not necessarily a safe gauge for measuring the age of that thing. I believe in the 24-hour creation that God made the world as it is, all things therein, and placed things in motion and over a period of time, he followed natural law. Always remember this, it was miracle first and then natural law. And part of that natural law is that everything produces after its own kind. So don't let the appearance fool you. Stay with what is trustworthy, and that's God's Word. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question to Brother Sharnock. What is the sin which does so easily beset us, referred to in Hebrews 12, 1, with a Sharnock? Thank you for the good question. Let's read the passage to start. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so Christians are told to do two different things, lay aside every weight and the sin that which does so easily beset us. I see it as two different things. I think about the weight as something that will hold you back. Athletes who are in training may put weights on their legs or on their body so as to strengthen their bodies, but when it's time for the actual race, they will take those weights off so that they can actually run and they'll feel light as a feather, if you will, and they'll be able to run faster because of that training. 
but you don't want to run a race, race with those weights unless everybody else has those weights on then for it to be fair. And so when we think about things that uh, the weights that we need to set aside, we might think of things that are not inherently sinful but can still get in the way. When we have too many hobbies, too many things to do that ex take up all of our energy and time and we don't have enough time and energy to serve the Lord, then we need to let set some things aside so that we can run the actual race, the one that's most important, the Christian race, and succeed in it. But when we look at the sin that does so easily beset us, we're talking about something that is actual sin, something that is inherently wrong because God said so. 1 John 3, 4, sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. And so this could include things that are activities, things that God told us to do that we do not do, things that God told us not to do that we do, or the attitudes and motives behind Him. And so we need to make sure that uh, we are not committing sins or through what we say, what we do, or the attitudes that we manifest. But as we think about the sin that easily besets us, the word uh, easily besets is one word that means easily ensnaring, obstructing, constricting. Those things that tend to get in the way, that creep back up and get in the way of our uh, faithfully serving God. When we look at the broad context of the book of Hebrews, he is encouraging the, the, his audience to be faithful and to remain faithful throughout the entire book that seems to be the main theme. In Hebrews 3.12, for example, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He uses the Israelites of old as an illustration who disbelieved. They didn't trust God as they should, and God calls that an evil heart of unbelief. And don't be persuaded not to believe. Don't get so downtrodden that you think that God is no longer with you or that He no longer cares about you. In Hebrews 4, 2, the very next chapter, For unto us was the gospel preached, as was unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so they heard, but they would not will themselves to do it. Their attitudes were sour and they would turn away from God on numerous occasions. But we are encouraged through the pen of the Hebrews writer not to do that, not to disbelieve, not to falter in our trust. In Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, we're told, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which you have great which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye had done the will of God ye might receive the promise, continue doing the will of God. And then we have Faith's Hall of Fame, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 11, where God lists several people that throughout time and throughout the Old Testament, we remained faithful. They trusted God, they heard God, they did what God said to do, and they are ascribed as being faithful. And so God praises them in a, in a sense for what they did and uses them as an encouragement to us to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And so the sin that, does easily, that so easily besets us are those things that will stop us from being faithful and trusting God. And it may, be, it may have a reference to those things that may be habitual in nature, maybe you used profanity when you were, before you became a Christian, maybe you were in, indulged in uh, other sinful activities, taking God's name in vain, things that may creep up every now and then, let's get rid of those things that so easily beset us, those sins that may have been a habit. So that may be what it was. Maybe you had a, a constant battle with trusting God. Let's set that aside. And so when he talks about the sin that does so easily beset us, let's think about those things that, close, that ensnare us the easiest, and let's concentrate on getting rid of those things. Thank you for your good question. Thank you. We reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. The tract today is entitled, What is Happening to America? If you'd like to have this tract, What is Happening to America? Or if you'd like to receive our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may reach us by means of our contact page on our website. That's www.abibleanswertv.org. 
You'll find archives of our program there and also a link to our YouTube channel where we have archives as well. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll free number 1 800 436 0463. Our next question to Brother Liddell Does a person have to attend church to go to heaven? Brother Liddell. We're considering those who are accountable, that is, they have reached a state of maturity or understanding that they are thus responsible to God. And so do such people have to attend church to go to heaven. First of all, we might consider the words have to. If our motivation is because we have to do so, and that is all that motivates us, then we have a problem from the very beginning. It is the case, and I've known of such situations, where a person might attend every service of the church, never missing, and yet not have submitted his will to God's will, not have surrendered his life to Christ, not have submitted to the gospel and obedience to it. I think of one man in particular. He was a very fine man in many ways, and he was always present every service. This went on for decades. He was knowledgeable in the Bible. He taught his wife, and she obeyed the gospel, but he didn't. He taught his son, and he obeyed the gospel, became a gospel preacher, but still the man did not obey the gospel. The day came when he passed from this life, and they asked me to preach his funeral. It was a difficult one to preach indeed. He was present whenever the church came together, but that was not enough by itself. We do know, though, that there are some church members who sadly cannot assemble every time that the church meets together. It may be because of ill health on their part. It may be because they are care providers and they're taking of another, maybe a, another a spouse, a parent, a child, who has ill health and because of that they may not be able to attend every service. We know that they would if they could and it bothers them when they can't. There may be those who have work responsibilities such as uh, rotating shifts or first responders and such like who because of their responsibilities are not able to attend every time they would like to do so. And so it seems to me that the question that we need to answer is this, would God approve of my missing church services when I have the ability to be there if one could attend the service? and chooses not to do so, then what does that say about his attitude toward God? What does that say about his gratitude for all that God has done for him? The first pa passage that probably comes into mind when we think of this subject is Hebrews 10, 25. And let's look at Hebrews 10, 25 through 27 together. Not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. I like the statement that a brother made many years ago concerning assembling with the saints. He said, when I determined to follow Jesus Christ, I determined to assemble and worship God in Christ. He said, I made that decision then, and I've never seen a reason to change that. And so I don't have to get up on Sunday morning and ask the question, am I going to assemble with the saints today? Because I made that decision a long time ago. Brother Curtis A. Cates, who was a great friend and brother and longtime director of the Memphis School of Preaching, wrote an article, Why I Tend Every Service of the church. It's a great article. I'm going to uh, boil it down into these points and I think it will be correct according to what he wrote. Number one, assembling to praise God shows one's love for God and his gratitude for the sacrifice made by Christ. Number two, assembling helps one in being his brother's keeper and his being the husband or wife that he ought to be, the parent that he ought to be to his children in leading the lost to Christ, in restoring the erring, in loving the brotherhood, and in bearing fruit. Number three, assembling helps one to be faithful unto death by edification, education, and encouragement. Number four, assembling with the saints 
enables one to function as a priest, as we are indeed priest in Christ, to function as a priest in offering the sacrifice of praise which God has ordained. And then number five, assembling helps one to put the kingdom first and shows brethren appreciation for their work. For example, shows the preacher that we appreciate the work that he put into his part of the worship. Shows the Bible class teacher that we're thankful for all that they do and have done. Shows the elders that we're grateful for their leadership as they have brought us together in this place at this time and for the purpose of worship. And then Brother Cates concluded that he assembled regularly out of love for God and for the good it does for me. When we love God, we'll want to praise Him. When we want to praise Him, we'll assemble with the saints. And when we do that faithfully, obedient in our lives, worshiping as we have opportunity when the saints assemble, then we can look forward to being in heaven. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Brother Waycaster, should a married person have a close friend of the opposite sex? Brother Waycaster. It's interesting that when God created man, He created him as a social being. And He expects us to interact with fellow human beings. And when we become Christians, there is a especially close association that we have with brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to be kindly affection one toward another. We're to love the brotherhood, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. And the early church in Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, it said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And all passages such as that indicate that God intended us as His children to draw close to one another and to always seek to broaden the boundaries of our friendship toward those that we meet and come in contact with, both Christians and non-Christians. When my wife and I were doing mission work in South Africa, there was a gentleman there on business who was from the country of Scotland, and he was constantly inviting new people into his home, and on one occasion he invited my wife and I along with some others. And he made this observation that has always impressed me when it comes to making friends. He said, I do all within my power to continue to broaden my acquaintances, inviting them into my home, spending time with them, and trying to draw closer to them. Well, every individual tends to have some with whom he is closer to than others. Even Jesus had those apostles that associated with him that were closer. Peter, Andrew, James, and John appeared to be in a sort of an inner circle with Christ. It's not that He loved them more or any of the other apostles less. There were various reasons that drew Him close to them. So likewise, all of us have those with whom we draw closer to just by natural reaction. Now that leads me to the answering of the question. Should a person's close friend be a member of the opposite sex? I think in answering this question, we have to realize that God is not prohibiting us from being friends of those of the opposite sex. Otherwise, you cannot be friend perhaps half of the church, maybe even a larger percentage. But there is a great danger when I draw close to one of the opposite sex that that friendship may go beyond the boundaries and just appearances. My wife, for 52 years, was my best companion, my best friend. And we would talk about things together and share things with each other that we would share with no one else. Even there were others who would I would, we would bring into our circle of friendship, male and female both. We always maintained a certain respect for that friendship within the bounds and the confinements of God's Word. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the vainglory of life have often contributed to a man or a woman leaving their spouse and being drawn closer to another. And I need to use extreme caution that I don't become so close to someone that it leads me into temptation where I eventually enter into an illicit association or a relationship with that individual. So use caution, show your friendship, be friends to others, but restrict that close friendship 
to the bounds that God has placed within His Word? Very good question, and thank you very much. Thank you for that good answer. Brother Charnock, what is the meaning of the phrase, the spirits of just men made perfect in Hebrews 12, 23? Brother Sharna. Thank you for the good question. Let's look at the context. When we look at verses 18 through 21 leading up to verse uh, 23, in those verses he is drawing a contrast between the old system of things, the Old Testament, the law of Moses, and how it was inaugurated and when the church began. And so in verses 18 through 21, he says, We have not come unto the same system where God's incredible sense of power is on display, terrifying us. It was so incredible that even Moses was quaking. We haven't come unto that. But in contrast to that, you are come unto Mount Sion, not Mount Sinai, but Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, in verse 22, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable, innumerable company of angels. A different situation is not terrifying, but it's more of a, a, a blessing. In verse 23, to the general assembly, you have come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so he's drawing this contrast, and those who have come to the Lord's church and to the new system of things have come unto a situation that's far better and less terrifying than it was when the Israelites saw that display on Mount Sinai. And so that's the background of the verse, but there are two different groups of people that are listed here in verse 23. The general assembly of the church of the firstborn. In verse 16 of that very chapter, he speaks of Ab not Abel, Esau, who uh, sold his birthright, gave up the, the blessings that he had inherent to him because he was the firstborn. And so when we think about the firstborn, there are certain blessings. The church is composed of all a bunch of individuals who all can enjoy bl said blessings of the firstborn. And so we can have those blessings. In particular, we have the blessings, the spiritual blessings that are offered only through Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. And so he's talking, but he's talking about them, them as in, present, in the present world whose names are written in heaven. They're, they're still here. But then we go to the next part, and to, we've come to the spirits of just men made perfect. And come to is, he's, he continues on listing a bunch of things that we've come to. And so we've come unto these people, or rather these spirits. Well, what is a spirit? It's implying that these individuals have moved on to the next realm. They are not in body anymore, but they've gone on to the next, group, next realm of existence. 2 Corinthians 5, or 4, 16 through 5, 10 talks about how we leave the tabernacle so we can, we can be with the Lord. James 1.27 defines uh, death as being the separation of body and soul. And so these souls, these spirits of just men made perfect. The word perfect is the idea of complete. It's finished. Their life on earth has come to completion. But we look at the word just. Just has the idea of righteous. It is the same word, uh, just. And we've come to these spirits of just men that are made perfect. And as we think about coming unto them, we are part of the family of God, Old and New Testament in a sense. I think about Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. It says, For this cause I bow my knees to, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Those who have gone on, those who are still here. And so, as we think about these just people, just has the idea of doing what is right. 1 John 3, 7, He who does righteousness is right, righteous. And those who are deemed right, Romans 2.13, though they have a blemished past, they are seen as having been perfect. These just men have moved on, these just souls. And so we've come unto these just men who, are, uh, who have gone on, who are made perfect. And so basically it is those people who are the righteous dead. And so when we consider that situation, we've come into a better place where we're in a better family than our earthly family. We're in league with those who have gone on before. Thank you for that good question. We don't have long, but Brother Liddell, when should women stop teaching boys in the church? Brother Liddell. 
I joked with the brethren that I was going to say to the answer this to answer this question that she should stop at least by the time the second bell rings. But seriously, let us consider that, and the text we should look to is one we've discussed already in other programs, that is 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, that a woman is not given the right to exercise dominion over a man, to usurp authority over the man in teaching him. But we need to remember that it may be the case that a young boy might be, quote, baptized, end quote. Maybe 10-year-old little Johnny goes to his parents and says, I want to be baptized. And they talk to him. And they say, well, well, he knows what he needs to do. Uh, knowing what one needs to do and being accountable are two different things. But they go ahead and he is baptized. And the next Sunday he waits on the table and everyone's beaming. And then the preacher gets up to preach and looks back and little Johnny is back there misbehaving. He is passing notes. He's playing with his uh, baby sister. Uh, all kinds of things that he ought not to do. And the preacher has in the back of his mind that he, he wants to say to the father, would you please take Brother Johnny outside and instruct him in the way of the Lord more perfectly? Well, we see the problem there. Now, there is a matter of judgment involved in answering this question. Do we take that little 10-year-old boy who now has been baptized and do we put him in the teenage class? Or do we do as I have seen and put him in the adult class? Is it the case that a female teaching him in the class he would have been in uh, does wrong by doing so? I would ask this question. Could Johnny teach the class? Is he by his being baptized now a mature male that he could teach or that he should teach? And I'm sure we'd come with a conclusion that probably would say, well, he's not ready for that. So there is some judgment that is involved, and I understand too that sometimes brethren will uh, act on the side of caution. I appreciate that. I understand that. I have uh, seen that take place, and I understand the reason for it. We need to be sure that a female does not usurp the authority as she exercises dominion over the man. If that is the case, then certainly he should be in another class, or there should be a man teaching. Thank you. Well, he didn't have much time, but he did a good job, didn't he? Thanks so much to Brother Dale. And Brother Waycaster, this has been Brother Waycaster's first time to be on a Bible Answer. And uh, it has been 10 years since uh, Brother Dell was last on. And uh, not, not that long for Brother Charnock. But uh, we're so glad to have uh, these fellow faculty members from the Memphis School of Preaching on with us today. They do such a wonderful job in their work. And we appreciate the association that we have with them uh, in the program. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.